So we've been talking about population genetics, and we actually just finished discussing the Heidi Weinberg theorem and its assumptions. We talked about the fact that, according to the scientists, the uh, best way to stop evolution from taking place is having things like large populations, where it's extremely hard for any one given mutation to take a hold of the population, to have random mating, so that's actually very hard for any one given trait to uh, have an advantage, and that's actually you know completely random whether who you actually find as a partner to have no migration, so there's no flow in or out of new genes or old genes. Therefore, there'd be no selection, so that there's no change across many generations, and to be no mutations, to, to introduce new looks into the population. So, if you stop these things, then you stop evolution from taking place. And the opposite will be if um, you actually have these things happening in the population, then you're going to have evolution. And, and then we're going to talk about that in a second, but first to review the idea of microevolution is the idea that small changes will take place in the population across time. It will change, cause fluctuations of the allele frequency within the population. So those allele frequencies that we saw as constant through the heidi weinberg equilibrium, they can change and, or in other words, evolve if there's events that happen within the population that cause a shift in the allele frequencies. And that's by definition microevolution. And which is different from macroevolution, which is more like the origin of new species from previous species. So microevolutions are changes in the population within the same species, while macroevolutions is getting that and maximizing to the point that the species get so different from each other, or there are groups within the same species which are now so different from each other they can no longer interbreed, and therefore are considered different species. Now. My, the examples that we talked about of microevolution include things like, for example, the pesticide resistance or bacterial resistance that happens when you treat a pest on a field with um, pesticides or a bacteria with antibiotics. And then what happens is that the only ones that end up surviving are the ones which have resistance against the pesticide or, in the case of bacteria, the antibiotics. And then what happens is that in a few generations, the entire population is going to become composed out of the resistant strands and therefore you're going to be unable to use the pesticides or the antibiotics to kill the pest or bacteria in the, in the case. So you see this represented in the drawings here, how the population will flow from a population where the resistant strand was rare to a population where the resistant strand is all there's left and then the antibiotics or the pesticides stop working. Which is why in the long run it's actually a bad idea to use pesticides to actually treat uh, the fields or people with antibiotics uh, all the time because what ends up happening is you're going to end up creating uh, antibiotic resistance and we're going to need to stronger and stronger chemicals, which is never a good thing. Another example of microevolution we talked about is doing the genetics and, pop and also evolution series, we mentioned the idea of the moth, which changed in Europe because of changes in the pollution. You know, the trees used to be white, so the white moss was very, very common, and the black moss was rare because it would be easily spotted by predators. But as pollution sat in, in European forests and the trees turned gray, the black was suddenly more adaptive than the white, which now was going to be spotted easier, and all of a sudden the population shifts from white to black in just a few generations. That's macroevolution. Changes in the allele frequencies or the composition of looks or genotypes or phenotypes or allele frequencies in the population because of pressures from the environment, because of sudden shifts in the population, because of random effects, non-random mating, migration, selection, new mutations, and things like that. So let's talk about these mechanisms which drive the evolutionary process. So the causes for macroevolution are going to include everything that's the opposite of the heidi weinberg theorem. You're going to get microevolution if there are small populations. In other words, populations where random effects will be more pervasive, where small changes can make big effects. You're also going to get, get evolution if there's non-random mating. In other words, if there's selection or isolation or events which cause certain people to mate with other people, and which are specific. And you also have change in the population if you bring genes through from other elsewhere or if you take genes elsewhere so migration events which in, are called in genetics terms gene flow and you also have selection events which are called that cause the population to shift towards a particular look and you finally have mutations which are going to introduce new kinds of genes into the population if any of these things happen you're going to create new uh, LU frequencies in the population across generations and that's what microevolution is and now we're going to start spending some time discussing each one of these things. And so in the next few videos, we're going to discuss one by one the different mechanisms which cause microevolution.